Okay, welcome back after the break. Uh, just before we went for our break, we were looking at uh, and studying the prophecy in Isaiah chapter 42. We are looking at three facts uh, concerning the, the incarnation of Jesus Christ uh, and his work, uh, which foretells about the coming of the Messiah. And uh, we looked at how he, uh, Jesus, uh, as the servant, uh, which is mentioned in Isaiah chapter 42, uh, established the new covenant, who officiates uh, uh, the new covenant. And also the second fact we saw that was the servant was to open blind eyes, bring prisoners out and those who sit in darkness out of the prison house. Okay, so that's what we were looking at the second fact, we were studying that. The third fact is that servant was to bring forth uh, justice uh, to the Gentiles. Um, we see that, um, you know, Jesus as the servant, as the Messiah, uh, his ministry was not just restricted uh, to the Jewish people, uh, to the Jewish race, but his ministry was also to the Gentiles. It was also to bring justice and righteousness uh, to them. And uh, we see that uh, fulfilled as we read these passages in Isaiah chapter 9, Isaiah chapter 8. And we see that Matthew's uh, quoting um, Isaiah chapter 9 and saying that it has been fulfilled uh, in verses 12 to 16, where we see Jesus uh, ministering. Uh, his ministry was basically uh, around the Sea of Galilee and, um, and uh, where it mentions in um, Isaiah chapter 9 nine where it's talking about in the Galilee of the Gentiles and uh, we also see that uh, you know Jesus came and ministered there and how he uh, he uh, restored people's lives how he healed them how he delivered them from the uh, 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 you know powers of the evil one and also we see that you know uh, it was not just Jesus who ministered uh, to the uh, uh, to the Jewish race, but also to the Gentiles. We also see that, you know, this task was also assigned uh, to the body of Christ, um, you know, uh, where he uh, asked uh, uh, them to, you know, minister to the uh, Gentiles. And we see that the early church, uh, you know, fulfilled uh, this task um, uh, by ministering uh, to the Gentiles, as we read in Acts chapter 13, verses 46 to 48. So when, can one of you please read Acts chapter 13, please? Acts chapter 13, verse 46 to 48. Anyone? Acts 13, uh, 46 to 48. Then Paul and Barnabas grew bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you first. But since you rejected and judged yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, behold, we turn to the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded us, I have set you as a light to the Gentiles, that you should be for salvation to the ends of the earth. Yes, verse 88, 48, please. Now, when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as have been appointed to eternal life, believed. Amen. Um, thank you, Rin. So here we see, uh, you know, Paul and Barnabas uh, boldly uh, telling the Jews that, you know, even though they brought the word of God to them, the gospel of the good news of salvation of Jesus Christ to them, uh, and since they reject it, you know, they are uh, they stand in judgment uh, for their own deeds and for their own decision and their choices, you know. Um, but he says, now we will turn to the Gentiles. Because the Lord has commanded us, I will set you as light to the Gentiles, that you should be a salvation to the ends of the uh, earth. So we see that, um, you know, uh, uh, they were uh, not just doing it because they were angry with the Jews. And they said, okay, you don't want it, we'll go to the Gentiles. They're willing to hear us. But it was also what God had commanded them, had foreordained for them uh, to do it. And um, uh, we see this uh, uh, 
what they mention in verse 47. Um, and the Gentiles heard this, they glorified God, and we see that the gospel was taken to the Gentile world as uh, well. So also as Jesus came and ministered both to the Jews and Gentiles, uh, it's also uh, a command for us that we take the light of the gospel uh, to uh, to the people in all nations around the world, uh, people who um, you know are willing to receive and accept the gospel. Okay, so this is the the last prophecy that we were looking at uh, regarding the coming of. Um, the incarnate one uh, jesus in human form uh, the last prophecy that we studied anyone has any questions on chapter four any questions um anything that you all didn't understand you want me to explain again any doubts any comments Okay, if there's no uh, questions and no doubts or comments, the class is very quiet today. I don't know why. Uh, there's no questions or doubts, then we move on to Chapter 5, uh, where we're going to uh, take, take some time to understand uh, the incarnation, uh, God taking on human form. Um, so we're basically going to look at um, what happened when the eternal God you know, uh, uh, the uh, deity became humanity when the eternal God became the man of Galilee. Uh, we will not look at the historical uh, aspect of his um, uh, ministry and his uh, life here on earth, but we will look at the spiritual uh, Im implications. Uh, in this chapter, we basically try to understand, uh, you know, how uh, humanity and deity coexisted uh, in the person of Jesus Christ. Uh, we will look at how, uh, you know, God uh, took on human form and we look at various Bible um, references. We look at it from a biblical perspective uh, to understand uh, incarnation. Okay. <clears throat> So we will go back to the familiar passage of scripture that we've been studying from the, you know, from our first class when we began looking at Christology, uh, John chapter 1, verses 1, uh, 2, and 3, and verse uh, 14. So can one of you read that again, please? John chapter 1, verses 1, 2, verse 3, and verse 14. John chapter 1 verse 1 to 3. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. Verse 14. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Amen. Thank you, Jackin. So here uh, we see, uh, we've already studied how uh, uh, the Apostle John, you know, introduces the second person of the Trinity, uh, who is God. He refers to him as the Word, and uh, we uh, looked at why he uses um, the word Logos, uh, or he uses word to introduce the second person of the Trinity because, uh, you know, uh, it had a lot of significance in the Jewish background, this word logos. And, um, and so, G and so J Apostle John is introducing um, uh, the second person of the Trinity, that is Jesus Christ, not as somebody who, you know, who they understood logos as, as a guiding reason or the principle of the mind or an, an intermediately being between God God and the human race, but this Logos himself um, is God. And uh, he establishes this in verse 15 where it says, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and um, 
truth. So in using this title word, you know, basically the Apostle John is drawing a people's attention uh, to the function of uh, the second person of the Trinity or uh, to the function of this Messiah who is Jesus. And uh, he's saying that he came to reveal uh, the glory of the uh, father you know who came and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory that means he came to reveal uh, the father to us uh, and he uses this word logos which means word because the word is god uh, is is basically he's saying that this word is speaking uh, to man about God. It is God revealing himself uh, to man in the person of Jesus Christ. And this word is um, God manifest, which means God uh, who is exhibiting himself, uh, uh, expressing himself in uh, human uh, form. And that is why he chooses to use this uh, uh, the word logos or the word word because uh, you know it is uh, the word that is uh, God uh, the word is God speaking to man it is God revealing himself to man it is Jesus who came uh, to reveal who the father is and it is this word who is the manifest uh, presence of the eternal God or uh, which means it is uh, this word who is uh, uh, God himself who's revealing God who's expressing or exhibiting or showing us who God really is or who showing us who God the Father really is. So in the incarnation, the eternal Logos became flesh. He dwelt among mankind. Um, and the word flesh, you know, is not to be taught only in terms of a human body, uh, which means it's uh, not to be understood as um, God, you know, uh, taking on uh, you know, uh, somebody else's body, possessing somebody else's body, um, uh, just the uh, just the body, but you know, he's uh, having his own uh, divine nature and characteristics. But here, it is the word flesh here is to be understood as somebody who's representing the fullness of humanity. That means Jesus was fully human. It was not that he took on just the structure or the outward form of a human body in whom uh, deity existed or the nature and the characteristic of God existed but only the outward form was uh, of that of a human being so that people can uh, look at God and understand God's nature. No, it was not just the outward uh, form uh, of a human being but it was also you know the very nature and the characteristics of uh, uh, what we as human beings have you know so uh, we will study about this in the next chapter where we talk about the humanity of Jesus how he is fully human uh, but we need to understand uh, that you know Jesus was not just outwardly in human form and inside in his nature his characteristic his attributes uh, he was not he was completely God and had no human traits no he was fully human in the sense that he had the outward appearance of a human being and also had uh, you know uh, he represent the fullness of humanity had the nature and the characteristics of a human uh, being so the eternal logos that means the eternal god you know took on humanity in the fullest sense in 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 all its uh, fullness so he uh, the flesh here is to be understood as representing the fullness of humanity everything that uh, we go through and that is why uh, it is uh, very encouraging for us to know that God who became man can understand our frailties, can understand our uh, weaknesses, uh, can know our shortcomings, but also raises us up to a higher level, a higher bar where we can say, hey, when God became man, he lived uh, as complete man, 100% man, full in the fullness of mankind, but yet he did not sin, yet he did not give in to the desires of the flesh, he did, did not give in to the desires of the carnal nature, which means that I have no excuse uh, 
to uh, you know uh, to go back into sin or uh, uh, knowing that I'm dead to sin now that sin has no power over me I can I can uh, I can understand that I can take that as a truth I can believe that and not doubt it because Jesus himself who was fully human was in the fullness of humanity um, was dead to sin you know sin did not reign in his in his mortal body um, sin had no control over him he uh, 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 and in every way he showed us how you know being fully human you can overcome sin so sin is not something that is going to dominate reign in my life overpower me but i can uh, say and declare and live as if to say I am uh, dead to sin. So now both of these aspects that can uh, just come back to our mind, knowing that God understands what we go through. Sometimes we think nobody knows, nobody understands what we're going through, uh, but God understands because he was fully human, uh, our high priest who's interceding, who's our mediator of the new covenant, he, he knows and also it brings us up to that level that God uh, expects us to live and placed us uh, at the right hand of God as, as somebody who's righteous, the same level as Jesus Christ and God sees us in that same level uh, that we are dead to sin, sin has no control and reign or power over our uh, mortal um, bodies. Okay, uh, this word um, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. The word dwelt, uh, you know, literally in the Greek means tabernacled, uh, which refers to the tabernacle in the in the Old Testament. Uh, you know, it was a tent uh, of meeting uh, even before the temple was uh, made. You know, when the Israelites moved from place to place, they had this tent of meeting uh, where had they had this. Um, uh, the Ark of the Covenant and God would appear to them uh, or manifest his glory, speak to them, uh, 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 you know, uh, 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 as a, it needs to come as a cloud over that uh, tabernacle. So God manifested himself, manifested his glory, which means manifested who he is and what he uh, does among his people, even as they journeyed from Egypt to the promised um, land. And of course, after that, we see him manifesting his glory in the temple. So we see that even as the people journeyed, you know, uh, God lived and moved with his people in this uh, tabernacle. So his presence was literally with the people, going with the people, uh, because he dwelt with them, he lived um, with them. Um, and we read about this in um, in in First Chronicles chapter seven. Sorry, First Chronicles chapter seventeen was. Uh, five, where it says that God lived and moved uh, with his people in his tabernacle. Uh, we also see that we read in Isaiah chapter 63, verse 9, in all their afflictions he was afflicted. So uh, God did not just, uh, you know, go with them. His presence was not just moving with them. But when they felt afflicted, you know, it was as if to say he himself was afflicted. That means, you know, he was so much part of uh, his uh, chosen generation, his chosen people, uh, the people that he called forth, uh, his uh, his royal priests, his priests that he set apart. You know, um, it's just wonderful to, to know that, you know, a God who's so holy and these people were constantly grumbling and murmuring and complaining and sinning against him, even then God chooses to journey along with them, uh, you know, his glory was manifested, they see his glory, who he is, what he does, his miracles, his power, uh, and also in their afflictions, in their um, in their troubles, in their, you know, difficulties, uh, in their misery, in their pain, in their illnesses, uh, he was afflicted. So, you know, um, uh, also now we don't um, have this tabernacle uh, but you know uh, as part of the new covenant our bodies are the temple of the living god the most high god uh, dwells in us so even as we go through troubles and difficulties and miseries and and illnesses you know um, uh, we know that uh, god is there with us his presence is there he's a very present help in times of trouble and also you know he uh, sees our affliction he he knows what we are going through he understands he relates to us uh, because he's experiencing it himself uh, like he uh, it happened for the people in the old testament um so in the incarnation god came to dwell with mankind just like he dwelt 
uh, in the past his very presence was there you know he dwelt with mankind and that is why uh, we see that you know he was also afflicted with their affliction not only with the people of the, uh, the old testament also in the new testament we see that you know every time jesus was tired he moved away to a solitary place and he was you know he was crossing uh, the rivers that he could move to a solitary place but when he comes to that uh, to the to the other part of the shore he sees the crowd just waiting for him and you know it says that he was moved with compassion you know uh, he was moved with compassion he does not say hey man you know uh, i'm tired i just need to get some rest uh, you people just give me a break leave me but we see that jesus got on the boat and just ministered uh, to people when he when um, he saw mary and martha weeping over lazarus he wept when he saw the uh, the widow uh, you know uh, taking uh, the son's funeral you know he was moved with compassion so we see many places where jesus was moved with compassion so here it was not just god dwelling with mankind in the sense that he had just come here you know to um, die for your sins and after that you know i'm just going to do my job and go back but he came to and he mingled with us uh, he understood our frailties, our weaknesses. He ministered uh, to people at the point of their need, and uh, he had mercy and grace. Even in the crowd, you know, um, uh, in that big crowd, he stops at the sycamore tree and he looks up and uh, calls Zacchaeus uh, down. He's concerned of the sinners, you know. Um, uh, Bartimaeus in that crowd, you know, when he uh, uh, shouts out you know uh, uh, jesus stops and says who is that so they said don't the, the crowd said don't worry just a blind man party me as a beggar you know but jesus uh, meets him and heals him so we see his compassion and uh, so that is what means uh, uh, the word means dwell so when god dwells in us you know he's connected uh, with us in every aspect of our lives uh, what we do he's interested what we say he's interested what's happening <clears throat> sorry he's interested in what is happening in our lives and also you know um, um uh, what we how we are living our lives uh he's interested he's mindful and he uh you know uh is very very active okay so look at what um, uh, isaiah chapter 60 uh, the next uh, sorry uh, so we saw that the word became flesh and dwelt among us we are we are meditating on John chapter 1 verse 14. We looked at what the word is, uh, the word became flesh, what flesh, the word flesh meant. We looked at what dwelt meant, uh, the word dwelt, and also that we beheld his uh, glory. Okay, now the Greek word for the word glory means uh, doxa, uh, and uh, it originally meant honor, reputation, uh, reputation or esteem. Uh, which is given to a person uh, so you honor a person esteem a person you hold them in high regard in the new testament the greek word for glory which is doxa is used to denote uh, uh, again honor splendor and majesty which is basically talking about um, uh, you know god's honor his glory his majesty uh, so when we're saying that the word became flesh we're saying that uh, you know uh, the incarnate one uh, the one who was uh, God who manifested in human flesh, you know, uh, uh, is of divine splendor, power, uh, majesty, and has to be ascribed glory and um, honor. Okay. So when Jesus walked on this earth, uh, you know, uh, one thing to, uh, to understand this word glory is that, you know, he, um, he did not uh, uh, manifest the glory of God. If he had manifested the glory of God, then we, no one could see him. No one can look at him with our, with our human eyes, with our naked eyes, because, um, you know, the word of God says uh, in First Timothy chapter 6, verse 16, that God lives in unapproachable light who no man has seen or can see because of his glory. Uh, because of his glory means, you know, his splendor, his majesty, his power, his dominion, his uh, honor, you know, the glory that he has, uh, which is referring to all of these things, you know, no man can see him. Uh, so if Jesus came on this earth, you know, we say he was fully God, he was fully man, uh, but in what aspects uh, he was not 
uh, you know, he did not manifest the full nature of God is in one of these aspects. He did not reveal the, the glory of God, but he revealed the sonship glory. Because he revealed the sonship glory, you know, uh, people were able to uh, see it, uh, people were able to see him, people were able to know who the Father is. And that is what, you know, when we read in John chapter 1, verse 14 says, uh, who came, uh, you know, uh, in the flesh, dwelt among us, and beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So when we, uh, you know, talking about this glory that Jesus manifested or expressed or exhibited or showed when he lived here on this earth, it's not his uh glory of his deity, not the glory of him being God, but he manifested the sonship uh, uh, glory. And how did we know that he manifested his sonship glory? If you look at uh, John chapter 17, which is the high priestly prayer of Jesus, if you just look turn to uh, John chapter 17, um, you know, here in, in this chapter 17, Jesus says, you know, um, Father, uh, I have um, I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work. Um, uh, look at verse 4 okay, of John chapter 17. It says, uh, uh, Jesus says, I have glorified you on the earth. Jesus is, this is his, his prayer to the Father. So it's I is referring to Jesus. I have glorified you. Is referring to the Father on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given to me to do. And now, O oh Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Okay. And then he goes on to say in verse um, 22, And the glory which you gave me, I have given them that they may be one just as we are one. Okay, so here Jesus is saying, you know, I have in verses four and five, uh, uh, Father, I have completed everything that you have uh, uh, given me to do. Now I'm just waiting for to come back and to, uh, you know, to be with you and to be glorified, which means to receive back uh, the glory of uh, that you know, is connected with deity, okay, uh, with the glory which I had even before the world was, which means, again, it's referring to, uh, so here is another verse of scripture where we can show that Jesus is God, um, because he has the glory of God, which means he has majesty, splendor, the power of God, uh, which he had even before the creation of the world. But when he came here on this earth, you know, though he was fully man in the entire sense, uh, in uh, and he was fully God, but, you know, uh, he gave up, uh, you know, uh, his, his glory of the deity. Uh, why did he do that? So that, you know, people can see him, people can see and know who God is, can experience uh, um, God, even as Jesus expresses himself and, and he goes around doing his ministry and teaching. If he had the glory of deity, the glory of God, then no, no man can see him uh, because that is what uh, First Timothy chapter 6, verse 16 uh, says. And we see that, you know, Jesus is praying to the Father. They saying that you know um, in verse 22 and the glory which you gave me which means the glory that uh, God the Father gave him or which Jesus took upon himself which is a sonship glory you know which he lived here on this earth he had the sonship glory he says you know I have given them which means I have given uh, people who believe in me I've given the believers it's talking about them also refers to us uh, as people of the new covenant, that they may be one just as we are uh, one, okay? We'll study more about this in uh, detail, but it's very important for us to know that, you know, uh, you know, Jesus lived here on this earth in his sonship glory, not the, day, uh, the glory of deity. And the second thing is, you know, just uh, look at, you know, another spiritual uh, uh, privilege, inheritance, a blessing that we receive is that uh, Jesus has given us that sonship glory. And that is why Jesus says, you can do greater things than what I have done, because he has given us this uh, sonship glory. Glory basically means, you know, uh, who God is, what and what he does. So who God is, we're able to manifest the, the, the fruit of the spirit, what he does, we're able to to manifest the gifts of the uh, 
spirit so when uh, uh, when god became man uh, uh, or uh, god uh, you know uh, became god incarnate he became flesh the eternal word uh, this eternal god submitted himself to certain limitations uh, which for us is not very easy to understand or completely define uh, but he could reveal all of that or, or he could reveal what he could could reveal to us uh, in the limitations of humanness and that is uh, what we can perceive uh, what we can understand and uh, you know he limited himself in the terms of not having uh, uh, the glory of deity um, and because he limited himself in that area, you know, uh, he could reveal himself and we can see the revelation of God. We can see who God is. Um, and, uh, you know, and that and uh, it's a ways in and means in which we can perceive and understand, uh, you know, God through uh, uh, our human intellect, uh, through our uh, fine, through us being finite uh, beings. Okay. Um, Yes, so God was, uh, Jesus was fully God, fully man. Um, he is God who became man. Uh, but, you know, he did not become uh, flesh in the sense of ceasing to be what he eternally was. So, which means that, you know, um, Jesus was completely God. He did not cease uh, to be eternally who he was, um, but rather the eternal God you know, took on the fullness of humanity, okay? So he was fully God, uh, he's eternally God, this eternally God became uh, uh, or took on the fullness of humanity, which means uh, he had the spirit, soul and body uh, and he was fully man like uh, any one of us. Uh, but, you know, he limited the manifestations of his uh, deity. There were some limitations that he took upon himself uh, so that, you know, we can perceive him, we can understand him uh, so that, you know, he could reveal only what could be revealed in the limitations of humanness, which means he took on, you know, uh, he limited himself to certain manifestations so that he could reveal uh, uh, the Godhead or he could reveal who God is in the limitations of uh, us human beings or in the limitations of humanness. Okay, uh, we'll study uh, Hebrews chapter 1 verses 1 to 3 and uh, you know uh, we learn uh, some things about the word incarnate uh, who is God speaking to us. We look at some facts uh, regarding his incarnation. Before we move on anyone has any questions? <coughs> Any questions? I hope all of you are in class today. No one is asking any questions, no doubts. Is everything very clear? You've understood everything? Uh, may I ask you, are you able to hear me? Yes, 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 Nina John. Okay. Uh, I just wanted to um, ask that when he went through all the pain, because uh, you've been saying that he did not cease to be who he is, but he limited himself to being uh, fully human also. Um, so then when he went through all that on the cross that he did, so we know that he was really going through all of that just as any human. Uh, <laughs> I mean, when would ha would they have been uh i mean is there the deity involved there in the sense that he had the uh, strength to bear that pain because of uh being who he is or you know i don't know i hope i, I wonder if my question is clear yes uh so yes, he was complete. That's why we say he was, you know, completely human. He took on the fullness of humanity. So he went through uh, all that pain and suffering as a human being. But uh, you know, he did not uh, use. Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, another thing we need to we'll study about this is uh, when we look at, um, you know. Uh, 
uh, uh, Philippians chapter two, verse six and eight, um, where we start, we we read that you know um, he emptied himself. You know, uh, it does not mean that he emptied himself, um, uh, not in the sense of laying aside his es essential nature of deity, but rather that he willingly refrained uh, in exercising or expressing his divine attributes, that of omnipotence, omniscience, or omnipresence. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, we say that he willingly refrained. That is why we do not, uh, you know, in Christology, we do not dare to attempt to talk about the how of the incarnation, uh, because, you know, there are very puzzling things, but um, uh, but he refrained in exercising or expressing his divine attributes of being omnipotent, which means in his power he could have um, diminished the power of, uh, you know, the human uh, sufferings which he was going through, so he could have shown it uh, physically that he was suffering, but inside he wasn't suffering because through his omnipotence he could have nullified all of that pain and all of that, those things. Um, Omnipresence could mean that he could be present there on the cross, but he could be present uh, somewhere else. So what we're looking at is just a, a form of his body there, but you know he's actually not going through all the pain and suffering. No, but what we are saying is when he emptied himself in Philippians chapter two, which we read, it says that you know uh, he uh, did not lay aside his uh, deity. Uh, a nature of being God, his characteristic, his attributes, but he willingly refrained in exercising and expressing them. So, you know, when he was hungry, he was angry, he was tired, he was sleepy, you know, uh, all shows his humanness. And even on the cross, when he went through, it was because of his, he was fully uh, God, sorry, uh, sorry, fully man, yet being fully God. Did that help, Nina? Yes, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so we look at um, Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1, 2, and 3. Can somebody read that, please? Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1, 2, and 3. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed there of all things, through whom also he made the words, who being the brightness of his glory and express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself Urged our sins set down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Amen. Thank you. Uh, so here we see that, uh, you know, uh, it's qualifying uh, what um, the Apostle John is writing and introducing the second person, the Trinity, uh, this Messiah, uh, who is Jesus, as the Logos, and saying God who at various times and in various uh, uh, ways spoke in the time past to the fathers, um, uh, you know, uh, by the prophets, but in these last days he's spoken to us by his son. So, you know, the writer of Hebrews is attributing and saying, hey, this is the word. The word is the word incarnate, that is God speaking um, uh, to us. And it's also this word who through whom he made the worlds, uh, uh, you know, created everything. Um, and he says, notice two uh, facts uh, regarding incarnation um, in this verses. The first one is Jesus is the brightness of God's glory. The second one is that Jesus is the express image of God's uh, person. If you look at, um, uh, you know, uh, verse 3, which we are just looking at, Jesus is the uh, brightness of his glory, the first part of uh, verse 3, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image uh, of his person. If you look at this, uh, these sentences, these phrases in the Amplified Bible, it says he's a soul. Soul means, uh, you know, 
the one and only, the one and only, the sole expression of the glory of God. And he is the perfect imprint and the very image of God's nature. So uh, Jesus uh, 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 is the only one who is the sole expression or the one who can fully or solely express the glory of God because he is God himself and he is a perfect imprint. Imprint means, you know, your thumb imprint, when you put your thumb imprint is exactly how the lines feature on and how God created and put those lines on your thumb. Okay, perfect imprint and the very image of God's nature. Look at what the Jerusalem Bible says. He's a radiant light of God's glory and the perfect copy of his nature. Uh, the New International Version says he's, uh, the sun is a radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. And the literal Greek, uh, uh, you know, Bible, the lexicon, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, it says, who being radiance of the glory and the representation of the reality of um, him. So Jesus, you know, uh, two facts that we see here. The first one is Jesus, the brightness of God's glory, which means God's glory is manifested, is expressed, is revealed uh, in the nature. Uh, 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 the, 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 uh, Jesus is the manifestation of the nature and the attributes of God, which means the attributes in the nature of God is fully expressed, revealed, seen, exhibited in um, the person and the work of uh, Jesus Christ. Um, Jesus Christ is the expression of who God is, what he does. Uh, he is a brightness, which means the uh, he is shining out the nature and the character uh, of God. It's also brightness, also reveals, you know, throwing light, which means uh, revealing to us, making it known to us, or it's very evident. Now, when you throw light on something, uh, things become very evident, things become very uh, clear, things become very knowledgeable. We know there is clarity. So he's a brightness, which means Jesus is... Uh, you know, uh, uh, through his life and uh, his ministry, you know, uh, the the nature and the character of God is very evident, it's revealed, it's clear, uh, can be easily understood, read, uh, and we can receive knowledge and information. Uh, it's, uh, it's the perfect revelation. Uh, and so Jesus came to reveal who all who God is, um, and all who God is, is shown in the person of uh, Jesus is exhibited, shines out through uh, Jesus. He's also the express image of God's person, which means he's the perfect, complete uh, representation. Uh, you know, he's the exact repre representation, uh, the exact uh, uh, representation of the reality of who God is, the perfect copy, the perfect imprint um, of, um, uh, of the living God. So, uh, you know, Jesus is the perfect representation of the nature of God, who he really is. So in the incarnation, you know, we have a complete revelation of this living God uh, who we uh, can, you know, we're beginning to know and understand who God is, uh, what he is like, what is his nature, characteristics and attributes and what he uh, does. So all of who God is, what he does is revealed to us perfectly in the person of um, Jesus Christ, because Jesus is a brightness of his God's of God's glory. I explained that. And he is also the express image of God's um, person. OK, um, we'll just look at a little more about the image of God. Uh, Colossians chapter one, verse 15, the first part of that verse says, uh, Jesus is the Im image of the invisible God. In second Corinthians uh, chapter four, verse four, the latter part of the uh, verse says, Christ who is the image of God. Uh, so the word image means, uh, like we just saw, exact uh, representation, the exact revel uh, revelation. Uh, it is a perfect copy, the perfect imprint of the image of God, of who God is. So in the incarnation, uh, it's the invisible God becoming visible. And this invisible God who no man, who lives in unapproachable light, who no man can see or has ever seen, has made it evident to us, has manifested himself, can be seen, can be understood, uh, can be read through this clarity is because Jesus did not uh, chose to lay aside his um, 
uh, uh, you know, his glory as deity and took on the sonship glory uh, which he gave to us. And that hence, you know, um, uh, he limited himself to certain things of the human nature uh, so that we can perceive and understand God in the fullest sense. And that is why you see in incarnation, the invisible God becomes uh, visible. Okay, and in, uh, in Philippians chapter two, verses six to eight, uh, we will study seven steps in the incarnation. So, can one of you please read Philippians chapter two, verses six to eight, please, quickly? Philippians chapter two, six or eight, ma'am. Six to eight, six seven eight. Okay. <clears throat> Who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bond servant and coming in the likeness of man, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death even the death of the cross amen thank you so here uh, we look at seven steps in the incarnation in this uh, in this uh, passage very important passage of scripture uh, christ uh, was in the form of god uh, he was equal with God. He did not consider it to be robbery with God. He made himself of no reputation. He took on the form of a bond servant. He came in the likeness of man and he was found in the appearance as a man. So we'll just study each of these in the sequence that it comes uh, in, in this uh, passage of scripture. The first thing we see here in verse 6, uh, Jesus Christ who being in the form of uh, God. If you look at uh, the Greek uh, lexicon, the Greek Bible, it reads, who subsisting in the form of God, which means who subsisting means living or existing in the form of um, God. Okay. Um, now, this word form uh, is the same word which is used in this uh, passage that we read, the form of a bond servant. And uh, it, you know, it is to be, it's not the same as mere likeness or appearance, which means that, you know, um, uh, uh, Jesus, um, you know, um, uh, was in the form of God, which means that he was not somebody who was like uh, a human being or appeared as a human being but he was fully human uh, but, but when we look at the same uh, verse which we the verses that we read there's another form a word another form uh, another word called form there one in relationship with the uh, form of god verse 2 and uh, the latter part of verse 7 it says the form of a bond servant so the form of a bond servant there was like a bond servant in appear like a bond servant would be that means jesus was not a bond servant he was not a slave um uh, but he was like a slave he took on the role of a slave but he was not a slave it's not full, uh, like born as a servant um uh, so in that sense form means like or a you know, um, it, it means like or appearance. But here when we are saying this form, uh, form of God, the Greek word here for form of God, this is not the same as used for bond servant, where it's a form of a bond servant. But here form of God does not mean that Jesus was the likeness or appearance of man. Uh, he kind of appeared like a man. No, he was, or he was like man. No, he was fully man. Okay, we can't say he was like a human being, he appeared as a human being. No, he was fully human being in the fullest sense. Um, so we need to understand this, that the word form is not used to denote something that is just outwardly or external, but it's talking about the very nature, the attributes. So in his being, in his essential nature, in his attributes, uh, you know, he was fully human, uh, just like uh, he was outwardly human in his very core fiber of his being, his attributes, his essential nature, he was uh, uh, um, uh, as any other human uh, being. So Christ 
uh, when he became incarnate, you know, or when Christ uh, existed as God, possessing and being all that pertains to the divine nature, you know, even as he was God uh, and having all the divine nature, even as he existed as a human being, he possessed all the uh, essential nature and attributes of a human being. Okay, so we'll stop here and we'll continue next week. Anyone has any questions, doubts? Any clarity on anything that was spoken? A thought? No, uh, today we went through a lot of um, uh, content, you know, and I request all of you to please take time to go through the notes, to read through, uh, to understand. Uh, so that when you come to the next class, you know, if you have any doubts or questions, you can ask. And then we can also follow through the rest of what we are studying in Christology. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for uh, joining class. Sorry. Um, thank you all for joining class. Have a blessed um, uh, day ahead and a blessed week, uh, the rest of the week, God bless, thank you.